We now come to the study of the epistle to the Ephesians. Paul is in Rome. He spends, we're told at the end of the book of Acts, two full years in his own hired house in Rome. I guess he's under some sort of house arrest, but it doesn't seem to have really amounted to much in the way of imprisonment. He seems to have been free to work, free to have visitors, free to do the things that he normally did. And one of the things that Paul normally did was write. There seems to have been continual traffic to and fro also. There were people who brought letters to him from Ephesus, from Laodicea, from doubtless from Antioch in Pisidia and Antioch in Syria or wherever it was, uh, people arrived. Rome was the basically the center of the world at that time. Everybody involved in commerce came there at one time or another. And, of course, letters were carried by hand by people. And Paul learned what was going on here and there. You find in these next three letters, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, all three of them that called prison epistles because they were written from Rome during this first imprisonment. You find indirect references to people coming and going again to the messages that they brought. So we start then with Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1 to understand what Paul is saying in the, in, to the churches at this point in his ministry. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, to the faithful in Christ Jesus. The word saints is rather interesting. It it comes from the Greek word hagios, the basic root, which means separate, uh, set apart as belonging to God. It's also interesting in some of his epistles, like Corinthians, he refers to the people as saints and then later on rebukes them as being carnal. But nevertheless, these are the people who are called, set apart, who are the, the holy ones, not necessarily, in, ironically, in their conduct in all cases, but they are holy in the sense that they belong to God, that they are set apart for him. To all the saints which are in Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, it seems unlikely that that means he has chosen us individually by name before the foundation of the world. For if that were true, God would have had to, down through all generations, have selected every person who was going to marry to every other person, have seen to it that all those liaisons took place, the marriages took place, the children that were born, in many cases the children were born without the marriages taking place, of everyone that is in the church today. That seems rather unlikely. More likely, Paul uses the the word us, and he probably means the church, and speaks of us in terms of a, a population, a general grouping of people, that he chose before the foundation of the world that there would be a church, that there would be an us who believe in Jesus Christ, but that it was not necessarily determined at that time which ones of us would actually comprise that group. That seems unlikely. But nevertheless, the whole plan was laid out, that God knew that he would be choosing an elect at this time in history, and that decision was made before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So God is revealed to us as a father, and we are told that we are adopted as his children. And that's where the concept of sanctification comes in, of being saints, of being holy, or being separate or belonging to God. We belong to God in the sense of adopted children, belonging to their parents. We have been attached to him. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted, or objects of grace, in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, It's no longer a mystery. It's been revealed to us. The plan of God, what he is doing, where he is going, why he is doing it, is all revealed in the gospel. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are upon earth, even in him. It's exalted language, and the meaning is plain. It means essentially that the time is going to come when everything in heaven and in earth will be gathered together in one in Jesus Christ. One version of the Bible says that he might head up in one everything in Christ. So he is going to be the head over all. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. It's an interesting uh, analogy that he draws here in saying that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is a kind of earnest money. Most of us are familiar with earnest money when we purchase a house. We write up a contract, we sign the contract, and of course the contract theoretically in law is enforceable, but sometimes that is successful and sometimes not. What we do to show our earnestness or our sincerity or to commit ourselves to this particular contract is that we sign a check for $500, $1,000, $1,500, and we turn it over to the real estate agent and he puts it in an escrow account, which means an account apart from his own funds. And that money is there as a kind of, not really quite a down payment, but an earnest, a small payment to guarantee the purchase. The Holy Spirit given to us is God's guarantee that he will ultimately redeem the purchased possession. The presence of the Holy Spirit in you, then, is God's earnest money of the resurrection of the dead that he will redeem you, that he has purchased you, that he is committed to you, and has given you, in a sense, that down payment. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love toward all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And that is the greatest gift that God has given us. It's not healing of physical sickness. It's not even necessarily the promise of the resurrection, except indirectly. It is the promise of himself, that you can know him, that you can have fellowship with him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and has put all things under his feet. Everything. There is not one being, one creature, one physical object in the entire universe other than the Father himself that is not going to be put under Jesus Christ. And he has given him already to be the head over all things to the church. Jesus Christ is the head of the church over all things. You might want to ask a question at some point in time then, if you're thinking in terms of a, a pyramidical style, style of government, when you come down from the top in a pyramid, you co- don't come down to one. You come down to several. It may be two, three, four, five, or six. You don't come one, one in a straight vertical hierarchy. You have one who is the head, and then you have a number of those who are immediately below him, and then each one of those may have five or ten or some group below them. Jesus, then, is the head of the church. Will there be a singular, physical head of the church under Christ? There's more than one religious organization that believes that there is. The Roman Catholics, for example, believe that the Pope has been given the primacy in all things having to do with the church, 
that he is to rule over the church in the place of Jesus Christ, in their words, quote, when he should be gone, end quote. Well, uh, that's interesting, except Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. He's not gone. It seems to assume that he is not capable of governing the church without that human being between him and the rest of the church. Now, the strange thing about this is that Jesus made it very clear very early that he could govern the church independently of the apostles. Remember how we learned already that he did it? We've already gone through it. It's very plain, and it was very intentional. I think it was deliberate on his part to make the point. Without consulting Peter, without the involvement of John or James or any of the other apostles, Jesus Christ himself personally struck down a man named Saul on the road to Damascus. He personally took him away in the wilderness. He personally taught him and trained him in the ministry. And he personally commissioned him as an apostle to the Gentiles. And only after the fact did Peter and the others give to Paul the right hand of fellowship, acknowledging what had been done, for what else could they do? Now, Jesus did not make Peter the head of the church under him. He did not work through Peter to call Paul. And this was an important thing for Paul and for the church. And Paul is at great pains to emphasize this in his letters, as he says, Paul, an apostle not of men nor by the hands of men, but by Jesus Christ. And even in this letter, the indirect reference that he has put all things under Jesus' feet and has given him to be the head over all things to the church. And so Jesus can call a man independently of the existing visible body, commission him to do the work, send him out, use him, work with him, train him, teach him, without him ever knowing anything or even having association with those men previously leading the church. It may make some people uncomfortable, but it's in the book, and we've got to live with it. So Jesus is the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. And you, as he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Figuratively speaking, of course, we're still alive. We're still walking around. We still have blood coursing through our veins. Our heart is beating, and our eyes are blinking. But he says, you were dead in that condition in trespasses and sins. You'd broken the law. The law claimed your life. A death penalty, a death warrant had been written out for you. But he says, you, has he given life to, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, in this passage, a number of interesting questions are raised by many of the commentators. For one thing, what does it mean exactly that uh, Satan is the prince, the archon is the Greek word or ruler, of the power of the air? Now, does Paul mean to say by this that Satan is the ruler of and in control of and the dominant factor in the weather of this world? Some have suggested that, and that is one way of looking at the Scripture. However, there is another Scripture that says that God, you know, causes it to rain upon the just and the unjust, and that uh, God himself is the author of weather. And, of course, we know scientifically that everything basically that goes on in the weather is a natural phenomenon, that it happens because of the rotation of the earth. That's one of the most dominant factors that controls our weather. It happens because of the patterns of heating and cooling and a relative difference in temperatures in one place or another that causes air to rise and air to fall. We know that the patterns of moisture, the position of forests, the position of deserts, of dry areas and of mountains, all these things are actually physical things that have to do with the weather. Now, there's little doubt that Satan can intervene in and use the weather, but one really wonders if, if that's what this particular scripture is, is saying, because Paul's emphasis is that Satan is a spirit, and it's a spirit that is working in the children of disobedience, and I wonder 
since we know the connection between air, pneuma, and spirit. That this is what Paul is talking about. He is a prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. And he's talking more in terms of Satan's power, in terms of his spirit and his spiritual ability or his ability to influence the spirit of human beings and to work in them, even when he sometimes does not possess them. Both alternatives have to be considered as possibilities of what Paul is driving at here, because Paul would not have had or been dealing with uh, the weather and climatology and meteorology in modern terms because he would not have been aware of uh, that particular science at that particular time. So what did he mean? Uh, we can look at two alternative meanings. Satan is the prince of the power of the air, that is, he dominates the air around us. And of course, one of the old Greeks, Greek ideas was that the demons inhabited the atmosphere, the air around about the earth. But I don't think Paul just bought all the Greek ideas about demonology. But in any case, taking it in the simplest terms, in time past, you walked according to the course of this world. You followed, when you walk according to the course of this world, it says basically you're living the way the world is and goes. You're walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conduct in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. I don't think by nature means by birth. I think it's just by nature of the fact that it falls out naturally that way, living in this world and, and listening to Satan and being influenced by Satan, as all men are, that we go that way. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness to us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. That is one of the most encouraging scriptures in the Bible, one of the cleanest and simplest statements of the way of salvation. Grace basically means the unmerited favor. It's something that somebody gives to you or grants to you. You don't deserve it. You haven't earned it. You don't have it coming. It is absolutely unmerited, and you enjoy the favor of this person. By grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The faith is a gift of God. The grace is a gift of God. Salvation is a gift of God. It's not a matter of works, lest any man should boast. Because you see, if, if you could create faith by works, if there were some series of sacrifices that you could do, uh, some distance you had to walk, so many prayers that you needed to say, so many hours on your knees, so many calluses that finally broke and bled on your knees, and if all of this could achieve faith, then it would be for you to boast of, wouldn't it? So that even the faith is a gift of God by which you are saved. There is absolutely nothing that you can do to get rid of your past sins. When it comes to overcoming sin in your own life, you are limited in your ability to do it. There are some things you can accomplish. You can overcome certain physical aspects of things going on in your own body. Some people can quit smoking. Some people don't seem to be able to do so at all. There are some things in your life you can control, but the combination of sin coming at you from every side of your life, you'll never master it. You'll never master it completely. The only way you can be saved from it is by grace, through faith. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Of course we should work. But the salvation and the rescue and the grace comes by faith. It is not of works and not of ourselves. Now, having been saved, having God's grace given to us, and the immeasurable gift of God's faith, we are supposed to work good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. 
some people have fallen into the error. I, I think they're trying to avoid certain uncomfortable aspects of the law, of trying to say, well, see, there isn't anything, any law involved in the Christian way of life at all. It's funny, though, how difficult it is for people to see that when you have, have sinned, you need to be forgiven. But the only reason that you know you have sinned is because the law says you have sinned. Well, now, here is a law which defines sin, and you are guilty and you deserve to die, and then you receive the grace of God to be forgiven of all those past sins. Are you now free to go out and do those things which caused you to require a Savior in the first place? No, of course not. Common sense tells you that's not true. That those things of which you were guilty that caused the Son of God to have to come and die for you are wrong. They were wrong before you were converted, and they're wrong after you were converted. Some people don't seem to understand that if the law was abolished, then since the law was abolished, no one has ever sinned. Because without law, you can't sin. If it's not wrong, it isn't sin. And the law defines what's wrong. That's all it does. It doesn't accomplish anything else. So he said, remember that you, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Now, who's he talking to? Do you have any difficulty with that? Remember now, you, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Are we talking about Reubenites and Simeonites here? Are we talking about sons of Levi? Are we talking about sons of Joseph? No. No, we're not. We're talking about Greeks. We're talking about Latins. We're talking about Spaniards. We're talking about people from all over the known world. But we are not talking about Israelites at this point. Mainly, these people are Greek in nationality. You remember now, in time past, you were Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in flesh made with hands. At that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. What a desolate picture. What a tragic picture. Without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. These people were totally and completely cut off from God. They not only had no promises, they didn't even have the hope of promises. They had no covenant, no agreement with God. Israelites did. There was, even when they were carnal in their basic outlook and their way of living, nevertheless, the relationship with God was there for an Israelite, but not for you folks. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. Now, in the verses that follow, there's a little confusion that seems to arise as to what Paul is driving at particularly. When he speaks of being far off and being made near, or being separated and being brought together, is he talking about people who are away from God being made near to God? Or is he talking about Gentiles who are separated from Israel being made near to Israel? Well, you could ask the question, which of those is really important to the Gentiles according to Paul's writings? Was it really important that they be made near to Israel? Was it not more important that they be made near to God? Well, yes, it was. Yet, there is somehow in all of this the idea of being made near to Israel. As you read through it, you'll see what, it's, what I'm talking about. But first of all, he says, at that time, you were cut off from God. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, without Christ and without God in the world. Now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. If that stopped right there, you would have no problem, would you? You'd say, well, what he's talking about, you were far off from God? Now you're going to be made near to God. And there is no doubt that that is true. And that's what he's saying. But then he continues and says, For he is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. What is that middle wall of partition? Well, in Ezekiel 43, verse 8, we find a middle wall of partition described, which is a wall that is built between man and God. Israel was separated from God, there was a wall of partition between Israel and God. 
In fact, there was a place in the temple beyond which even an Israelite could not go. He was separated physically from going into the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could go in there to do his work of atonement for all of the people. But there was another wall. At the time that this was written, there was a wall in the temple that had been constructed. It existed in an area that was between the Gentiles in one area and the areas in which the Jews could go. As you went into the temple enclosure, there was an outer area where anybody could go. Then there is an area beyond which only a Jew can go. Then there was an area beyond which only a Jewish man could go. And when I use the term Jew, I use it in the broadest sense, including an Israelite, because but at this point there were relatively few people known of their nationality who were not Jewish in origin. But an Israelite male could go beyond this point. And then there was another place beyond which only the priest could go. Now back to verse 14. He is our peace who has made both one. Now that could be man and God made one. Or it could be Jew and Gentile have been made both one. And in fact, knowing Paul, it's entirely possible that he means both. Or he is prone to use dualities, dual constructions, and to do so deliberately. He is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now, God's law never commanded that the, this wall of partition in the temple exist. There was nothing to say that Gentiles should be separated from Israelites in the court of the temple. But the Jews had, over a period of time, built up and constructed a wall of partition between themselves and Gentiles. There are some rather interesting things in history to, to see, but one of the most interesting is that in the temple enclosure, there was a sign placed over to be read in several languages, to be read by any Gentile who came into the temple enclosure, that any Gentile passing beyond this point will be responsible for his own death, which will immediately ensue. Now, there was nothing in the Bible about that. That was something the Jews had constructed between themselves and Gentiles who came there to worship God, as many of them did, even oftentimes becoming circumcised and becoming proselytes in order to have that relationship with God. So there was a middle wall of partition between Gentiles and Jews that was not only physical, but that was also constructed of all the rules and regulations that made Jews wash themselves after touching a Gentile, that made them not be able to sit down and eat with a Gentile, as they would refuse to do so. They would not eat at the same table with a Gentile. And there were many such regulations which found no scripture in the Old Testament to support them at all. Then Paul goes on to say, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two, one new man, so making peace. Now, what was it that Jesus ab abolished in his flesh? Was it the law of God? Did he abolish the Ten Commandments? Was it some of the other statutes and judgments? The truth to tell, uh, Paul elsewhere in his epistles really supports the law and talks about the law and makes it very clear that the law is binding. Now, why would he here say, then, that he abolished it? Well, in the first place, if you diagram that sentence, it doesn't come out that way. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. No, it wasn't the law, then, that was abolished. It was the enmity, the enemy. What enemy? Well, the enmity between Jew and Gentile, and the en en enmity between man and God. For both enmities were very, very real. The enmity between man and God was created by man breaking the law of God. So you can see how that might work in this verse. Then on the other hand, there was the enmity between Jew and Gentile, which was created by the law of commandments in decrees or ordinances of men that the Jews had put together to separate themselves from Gentiles, to prevent Gentiles from coming near to them, from being defiled by contact with these common people. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in decrees, doubtless refers to those decrees of men which separated between men. His purpose, for to make in himself of two one new man. That's, of course, obvious what he's talking about there. 
is to make of the Jew and Gentile one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. It is the enmity that is slain. It is the enmity that is abolished, not the law of God. And it is the enmity that was created between Jew and Gentile by their laws, which they made to keep the Gentiles in their place. And so, Paul then says that there is a double reconciliation that has to happen. The Jew has to be actually reconciled to God. The Gentile has to be reconciled to God. And guess what? When we have reconciled both Jew and Gentile to God, how can they not be reconciled together? For it takes both of these walls to keep them apart. The wall between man and God and the wall between Jew and Gentile. You would really accomplish nothing if you broke down the wall between Jew and Gentile and allowed the Gentiles access to the Jews, for the Jews had cut themselves off from God too by their sins. So Jesus came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. This is the primary reconciliation you see. The reconciliation between Jew and Gentile is really almost irrelevant. It is incidental to all, to both of them being reconciled to God. We both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. It is that access to the Father that is at stake. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers or foreigners. You are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Chapter 3. For this cause, I, Paul, the, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me toward you, you you've heard of my commission that God called me and he commissioned me to come to you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read it you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And, of course, this was what you'll recall inflamed that mob in Jerusalem. They listened to him when he made his discourse right up until he said the word Gentile and implied that God was going to send the gospel to them. That's when it all came unglued. The message that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. You know, you have to understand the exclusivism of the Jews, not only in Old Testament times, but in New Testament times and their, their proprietary concern about God's law and about the temple and about the worship of God. And really, it's almost as though there was a proprietary interest in God. We own God. He's our God. He's the God of the Jews. He's not the God of the Gentiles. They have no right to our God. It's a strange thing in some ways, and yet it's very human. It's a part of, I suppose, the old in-group, out-group psychology. We're the in-group, you're out of our group, and our group is special, and God's in our group, and uh, you can't have any access to this. We're better than you are. That petty, human approach to these things. But Paul says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his gospel in Christ, his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given. Paul knew he didn't deserve it. He, of all people, was painfully aware of his lack of deserving it because he was the one who had persecuted the church. He says, I am less than the least of all saints, put himself right at the foot of the church. 
But, of course, when we start talking about what we deserve and deserts and what we've earned and so forth, there's really not much to choose from between the worst of us and, and the best of us. But to me, whom the less than the least of, the, of all saints, is this grace given, this unmerited favor. I didn't deserve it. I deserve just the opposite. But God called me and gave me this grace that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. And one wonders how in the world anyone can deny that Jesus Christ existed from the beginning with the Father, but some people persist in that. That God has created all things in Jesus Christ to the intent that now under principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And that's a shocker. When you begin to realize that there are principalities and powers in heavenly places, angelic powers, who are coming to know the manifold wisdom of God by means of the church, it's, it's stunning. To think in terms that, that an angel of God, a principality or a power from heaven, might actually sit in church and learn from the church things about the manifold wisdom of God, it's hard to grasp. Hard to grasp. You'd think he'd be able to walk up to God and ask if there was something he wanted to know. But I gather that the angels are in a different relationship. You know, Jesus said to the apostles that, uh, he said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Because a servant does not know what his master is doing. You see, you don't feel called upon or compelled to explain things to your servants. You tell them to go and they go. You tell them to come and they come. Angels are servants. They are not sons. And so it is that God has not revealed to angels what he is going to do. He slowly and systematically and deliberately reveals it to the church, and angels learn it at the same time and through and by the sons of God, who are not merely friends, but sons and family, and destined to know in the right time and the right place everything that God is doing. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You know, there have been many times in my ministry, and I think all other ministers have been the same way, when you just feel absolutely inadequate. You want to express the love of Christ to the church in a sermon. You want to try to explain what God is doing, and you feel you can see it. You, you feel you almost have a grasp of it. You can see it through a gra glass darkly, as it were. And you get up and you decide to give a sermon on love and the love of Christ. And when you're finished, you have to agree with Paul that the love of Christ passes knowledge. It is not something that you're ever going to just know by means of explanation or by means of Scripture or reason or logic, for it passes all logic, all knowledge, all expression, and can only be experienced. And even then, only in ways that sometimes we ourselves do not under fully understand as we experience it. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even imagine, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. It sounds like the end of the letter, doesn't it? In fact, it may have been. It may well be that, that there were more than one letter involved in this and that they actually have been combined. The, the students of the Bible have for years tried to sort out and, and try to understand 
But for our purposes today, we're going to consider it not the end of this letter, uh, that it continues right, right on through, that Paul simply was exalted by what he was talking about. He was carried away with it so much that he was led to say it this way. Then to continue with chapter 4. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, and Paul was still in prison in Rome at this time, in his first, in, first the first of two imprisonments. He was released after this one. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You might not realize it, but at this particular time in history, and in this world in which Paul lived and walked, unity was a major preoccupation. There was, of course, the peace that was enforced by the Roman Empire. And people had a, a vision of a world that was at one, that was at peace, to where nobody was fighting anybody. And then the philosophers looked for a unity that could be found in philosophy and a pursuit of the truth. And there's something about us all that we want to get rid of conflict out of our lives. We don't want to have to argue with people. We want to be around people who agree with one another and who are of the same mind and have the same goals. You have to understand Paul's statement coming out of this this idea and this feeling. And one of the statements he makes, one of the, the things that he proves here or demonstrates is that if we're going to have that unity, there's only one way. It's going to come through Christ. And it's going to come not because through some hierarchical form of church government we enforce that unity upon one another. It's going to come because the barrier has been broken down between you and God, and the barrier has been broken down between me and God. And you and I have come together because we have come to God. So Paul says, with all lowliness and meekness and patience, that we should learn to put up with one another. That's what the word forbearing means. It means putting up with one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, unity is a worthwhile goal, but not just any unity. And not just any unity at any price. And not just some unity imposed upon us by someone else. Oh, having unity calls for endeavor. It calls for a certain amount of work or effort on our part. But the unity we're supposed to be working for is the unity of the Spirit, not the unity of the Pope, not the unity of Rome, not the unity of a, a church hierarchy, but the unity of the Spirit. The unity that comes from being of the same mind, from being of agreement. Not because somebody makes us agree, or insists on it, or expels those of us who don't agree. That's one way, I guess, of getting unity. You expel all those people that don't agree and drive the ones who disagree underground where they won't admit it. I guess you can get a sort of unity that way. But it's worthless. Worthless and meaningless. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, that last verse is rather interesting because it is a bit of a qualifier for what goes before. There is, of course, one body, but where is it? What is it? Is there always only one work of God? Now, we get this one church. Certainly, we expect there to be one church. But he speaks of one body, which, of course, is the body of Christ. But where is the body of Christ? Is it, is it confined to and involved with one given organization and exclusive of all other endeavors? There came a time when two of God's ministers who had worked together in harmony for a long time and very effectively had a falling out. They, their falling out came not over a point of doctrine. Uh, it came out over a point of personnel. One of them wanted to take a certain man with them on an evangelistic journey. The other man did not. And we're told that the dispute between them became so severe that they parted asunder from one another, and one of them got himself a new man and went in another direction. 
So now we have two people who had a falling out over personnel matters going in two different directions. Do we have one work then or two? Well, I suppose in one way it depends on how you define it, doesn't it? They may not have been speaking to one another, but they were both doing the work of God, and in that sense there was, I suppose, one work. But generally speaking, the way we use language, that was two works, two separate and distinct works. There's not a hint that there was anybody over them that made that decision or could have overruled that decision or could have prevented it or could have headed it off. Certainly nobody did head it off. The two men, by the way, were Paul and Barnabas, who you would have thought would have stayed with each other and worked with each other until who knows when. But they didn't. They finally fell off. The fact was, to each one of them, there was grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And those gifts differ from one person to another. And your work is not my work, and my work is not your work. And God has given you your work, and he's given me mine. And sometimes those gifts take us in different directions. They shouldn't have us hating one another. That's carnal. They shouldn't have us fighting with one another. That's carnal. But you don't necessarily have to be under the same administration, physically speaking, in this world to be working for Christ. There's no hint of that anywhere in the Bible. In fact, there's every indication to the contrary. Unity is desirable. But it's a unity of the Spirit. It's a unity in Christ. It's a unity in God. It is not something that you and I can create out of whole cloth by some means of enforcement that you and I decide we're going to try to adopt. The only thing that happens in that situation is what Paul warned his disciples against when he said, look, he said, the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority over one another, but it shall not be so among you. Plain enough. We are not to have the enforced unity of authority. We are to have the unity of the Spirit. Now, for this reason, he says in verse 8, when he ascends up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? And he that descended is the same that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fulfill all things. And this is Christ, of course, who went down into the grave and ascended up on high, and he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. What are those gifts? Well, he gave some the gift of being an apostle. Started off with twelve. Called a few others, apparently later on. Certainly called Paul, who was an apostle at a later time. He also gave to some other people the gift of being a prophet. He gave some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. These are different things that different people are given to do. Now, it may well be that an apostle, man given that gift, was not really given the gift of being a pastor. Most of the apostles were evangelists in one sense of the word. But a man could be a teacher and not be qualified to be an evangelist. A man could be an evangelist and not be qualified to be a pastor. That the gifts are different. There apparently is a different gift for an evangelist than a, than from, from the one that's given to pastors or teachers. Now, why does God give these different gifts to different people? Well, that's simple. It's done for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Notice, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Not till that authority imposes the unity of the faith upon these people. That faith is not even immediate. That, that, that unity of the faith does not happen the day you get started. It is something that is constructed over time by the work of the ministry. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the work of the ministry. And that work falls out to teachers who have one set of gifts, pastors who have a different set of gifts, evangelists who have another set of gifts, all given to them by God, all for the different things that they're supposed to do, all for the things that they're individually supposed to accomplish. Now, if I am given the gift of being an evangelist and another is given the gift of being an apostle, should he and I be at odds with one another? Should we be competing with one another? Why should I as an evangelist compete with a pastor? Why should a pastor, given that gift, compete with a teacher? For the teacher is needed, and the pastor is needed, and the evangelist is needed. And all these people are necessary if we are to come in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man. 
The apostles did their work a long time ago. You and I still have our work to do. This is done that we be henceforth no more like children that are tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That's not the point. We're not to be tossed about or follow this doctrine off there or follow another doctrine off in another direction. We need to realize that doctrine doesn't change. We may grow in our understanding of it, but growth is a slow process, you know. You can sit down and watch a blade of grass for a long time and never see any movement unless the wind blows. And the same thing is true when it comes to growing up into Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. We're not to be blown about by every wind of doctrine. We are to speak the truth in love and to grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by what every joint supplies, every aspect, then, of of, of this body of Christ, of these people who belong to him, are supposed to be supplying something to the effectual working in the measure of every part to make increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not, as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of of their mind. The Gentiles didn't have a corner on this, by the way. The Jews could walk in the vanity of their minds as well as anybody else. But he's writing to Gentiles. Don't walk like your countrymen do, in the vanity of their mind, an ego of what they understand and what they can gain or what they can know. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness or hardness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Something inside of you is supposed to change. Something in the way you think. The spirit of your mind is supposed to be renewed. And that's supposed to take place initially at baptism. But it's something that goes on over a long period of time through the work that Jesus Christ does through his ministry. That you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying. Stop lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. We are members one of another. We depend on one another. We lean on one another. We support one another. Why should we lie to one another? If you get angry, be careful that you don't sin. And be careful not to let the sun go down upon your wrath. You get on towards sunset in the evening, you're still mad. It's time to go to a private place and pray and ask God to help you get rid of this. It's time to call your friend or your acquaintance or your brother whom you're angry with and see if you can't lay it aside. Neither give place to the devil. You see, in a sense, when we maintain that anger, we've actually opened the door and given him room, said, here's your place, you walk in, sit right out right there, there's room for you here. If you don't get rid of that wrath, he'll take you up on it. Let him that stole steal no more. It's time to stop stealing. If if you've been a thief in the past, let's stop it. Rather, let him labor, working with his hands, a thing that is good, so he may have something to give to people who are needy. You know, don't, don't steal. Go out and work. And then take some of the things that you earn and give them to people who have need. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed to the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now, that's a collection, isn't it? And it's a collection of things that, if they exist in you, will grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you were sealed under the day of of redemption. I can understand that. I can understand that God's Spirit in you would be uncomfortable with your bitterness and with your wrath and with your anger, your temper, your hot temper, and your clamor and your evil speaking and the malice that you bear toward other people. Make the Holy Spirit uncomfortable enough you suppose it would ever leave. There's an indication in the Bible that it will. So, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. 
You know, the world around us has worked hard to make us calloused, to make us hard, to, to keep us from feeling. And sometimes we, to try to get some feeling back, go to some rather strange lengths trying to get some feeling once again. But if you're not tenderhearted, if you're not able to just generously forgive another person, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, you know, brother, you need a time when you can stop and reflect and ask God to help you with this because you're going to need to find some way to get out of this pattern of hate and of bitterness and of anger toward one another or else you're never going to be able to make it into God's kingdom.